Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Hopkins, and today I'm really excited to be joined by Marcus Ogden. I'm really excited to see you, and I know uh, you, you know our producer, Broderick, here too, so I know we were all chatting before we got started. Uh, you know, He's a great guy, and I'm, I'm glad he was able to, to do an introduction between us two and, and get us together. Nice to meet you, Jamie. Thanks for having me on your show, my friend. Yeah. So um, get, can you give everyone the 30 seconds of kind of who you are, what you do in case they don't know you? Sure. My name is Marcus Ogden. I'm a national international keynote speaker, executive coach, corporate consultant, best-selling author. And I'm a former NFL athlete that went to Howard University. I played for almost six years in the National Football League. Yeah, so, so you've done a little bit of everything then. <laughs> what do you do? Everything. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. I love it. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's fun to have you on, and this will be a fun conversation. Uh, one of the things uh, I, I typically kick off with uh, kind of two icebreaker questions. Um, one of them's food. So I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, what comes to your mind when you think about food, um, you know, favorite thing to eat, or I, I'm sure, you know, athletes always have nice stories about food and, and probably <laughs> like a cycle of eating that they've gone through in their lives too. Uh, so my favorite food is a tie between seafood and Chinese food. So I'm a huge like crab legs, scallop, shrimp, fish guy. And I got to be careful because I had to get like lightly fried, which is not really mm. the best for you. It's so damn good. But I tried to eat that too much. And then my other weakness is Chinese food, like the bowl of spare ribs or sesame chicken or my real weakness, Jamie, is a good Chinese buffet. God, man, it could just put so much on me. And when I played in the NFL, at my heavy at my head was, I was 375, so I could mm. eat what I wanted, as much as I wanted. There was no real, like, you know, hey, watch what you eat. Not now, it's none of that. So those are my two favorites, seafood and Chinese food. Yeah, I mean, at, at 375, you, you, you're almost eating as a job to keep that weight on, right? Like, that's oh, not yeah. easy. <laughs> oh, yeah. But back in those days, you know, we played some huge guys, guys like oh, Vince Wolf, Prime, Sam Adams, to – Oh, Tim Bowen. I mean, like you're talking about, you know, Haloti Nada, you know, Maki Kimura to like, there were just some large individuals in the interior. So if you didn't have enough size, man, it was going to be a long day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a couple of those baltimore guys in there too you had and the, yeah those those were big guys <laughs> uh you uh you, you said you you grew up outside dc or in dc is that right in dc yeah okay. northeast dc very nice so are you uh are you like a, a do you like maryland crabs crab cakes too that, that in your oh, background yeah. yeah oh yeah i mean so when my brother got drafted by the ravens in 1996 i used to go a lot downtown Baltimore, like you know the inner harbor uh harbor east you know canton uh fells point federal hill power plant and the crab cakes downtown Baltimore were always on point always yeah, I, I I love crab cakes. It's one of my favorite things. And uh, I grew up mostly in Baltimore for, you know, west uh, over by like Randallstown, Reisterstown area, then Cadenceville. And then uh, I'm up outside of Philly now. But uh, yeah, I grew up there, a, a big Washington fan. And then I, I became a Ravens fan, but it took longer because, you know, I was, you know, they were they were the cast off Browns at one point, And I was like... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's that's how I bird people there. But it, no, you know, and then it became, you know, it they they got adopted so quickly as a team there, and people just fell in love with them, and you know, uh, it, it did a great job. And uh, yeah. you know, Ray Lewis, uh, he did a lot for a community too, and gave back, and you know, that also endeared people to them around there. So it was it was nice. Yeah, my brother was their first draft pick ever, and then Ray was mm -hmm. the same. It was the first round uh, was pick after he was. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, so he was there through the Super Bowl too, right? You won a Super Bowl in 2000 when they beat the Giants. Yeah. 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 I, I remember watching that and I, I guess I was still in uh, high school then, end of high school. I guess that was my last year. And um, I was just really hoping they'd give us off the next day and they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was 19. I was at the game in Tampa 
and I had, you know, a couple fake IDs. So like I was going to all the parties, having a great time. And it was awesome. And, you know, I was a 19 year old kid who was, a, uh, I was playing at the time at Howard. So I was an old lineman. So I had a good time, man. You know, it was nice to get out and see them Super Bowl and watch them win. And so that was just a great time overall. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, uh, uh, well, uh, the next question I usually go to, we'll get to more of those stories. I'm sure. Um, I, I typically ask people and I'll ask you too. the, you know, which is what's your first memory of money? Um, you know, as a kid, like positive, negative, um, you know, abundance, you know, scarcity, what, what comes to your mind immediately? So for me, it was, it was good because my father was the, one of the first African-American bank managers for his organization, they were a New York entity and he worked in their DC office. So he graduated from Howard with a degree in economics, got his master's from University of Maryland economics. So we learned all about money, money management from a very young age. So all my memories about money, about how to save, uh, how to put stuff away, how to have different accounts. Now, of course, back then, you know, we didn't really have a lot of, you know, bank cards. You had credit cards, not a lot of check cards. If you want to cash, you go to the bank, all that. So I learned about putting things away and having cash and business really couldn't get access to it because that truly is how you start to save and plan. And I feel I took that same attitude, Jamie, to the National Football League when I started making money. I knew how to what my what my income was gonna look like, what my expenses looked like. I created my own like little profit and loss, you know, statement so I could understand how to watch it. Because until I got to the NFL, after I got into the NFL, until then, Jimmy, I had never paid a bill, I never written a check, I had never known what credit was. So I had to learn those things quickly. Thank God my father taught me a little bit about this money overall knowledge. So when I got to the NFL, I had some degree about making more money on the income side and money going out on the expense side. <laughs> yeah. I, I like that you, you're like, you did my own little PNL profit and loss. And, you know, it's interesting because right as NFL players or, you know, actually, I guess most people who are employed somewhere, like you're your own business and people don't think about it that way. Right. But you bring in the income. And so understanding what's going in, what's coming out. And if you don't balance that, you don't look at it, right. You, you know, you end up not saving money and that creates a whole bunch of issues. Um, what was your first big purchase? I mean, a, as a kid, or if you didn't, if you waited until like what immediately comes to mind when I say that, <laughs> Uh, my, my first big purchase was my was my Escalade. When I got drafted, made the team, I bought myself an Escalade. That was probably not the best purchase, but I've made worse. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed it. I deserved it. I worked hard for it. I waited until I made the team, and I had I knew I was going to get a chance to play as a rookie, so I bought that in my, in my first year. Did that have TVs in it, too? Actually, it didn't have that until I got to Buffalo, and then my – actually, what am I saying? No, I got in Jacksonville, yeah, because I went ahead and got like the uh, the custom tees and the headrest, uh, uh -huh. and I got you know, the sound system in the back. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did that my first year. <laughs> <laughs> So funny story. Uh, so I grew up, uh, Michael Phelps is from Baltimore too. And we grew up, we, uh, we grew up together. We swam on the same team. We're about a month apart in age. Oh, I'm a wow. month older. I mean, it's not a big deal, but uh, <laughs> that's about the only thing I've got on him. Right. And, uh, <laughs> The, uh, but that was like his very first big purchase when he got his first endorsement thing in high school is he actually got the Escalade with the TVs and stuff in it. So it was funny. Uh, yeah. Awesome. That's, I, like that's, the, I like Michael for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> now, I've always been a fan of Michael. He's a huge poker player. Yeah, he is. That That's where he was the last time I saw him. So we were actually down in uh, uh, the islands for a speaking engagement and I was interviewing him for it and, and he was there at the tables playing. So uh and he had been down there for a tournament before he said too, but it's uh at what's what's that giant resort? Well, Atlantis. So Atlantis. Oh, yeah, oh, has... yeah, no, yeah. Oh, they had poker down there. They didn't they didn't used to have poker down there before. Now they do. That's good. That's good to know. Yeah. And uh all right. So uh let's get into your story a bit. Um, and that kind of starts where I know we've been it touches on pieces of it, but it starts kind of wherever you want it to start. So um yeah, I'd love to just hear more about you, how your journey began and, and where it went. So for me, just born in Washington, D.C., to a two-parent household, when I was eight years old, my parents got divorced. I ended up living with our, my father. We both did, me and my brother, we were raised by a single father. 
He was very big in our life about money management, responsibility, education over sports, you know, family values. You know, we learned a lot from him and it was just great because us being rather large individuals, I'm six, five and a half now, my brother is six foot nine. And my father was a big man, himself at six foot four. Having someone like that to kind of keep, you know, the boys in line and focused and driven was important. And we needed that. And I learned a lot about how to be a man and how to treat women, how to, you know, you know work hard from my father. So that was amazing. I went to St. John's College High School in Northwest DC, the same high school that Kevin Plankwell's Under Armour went to. Amazing high school great friends, great sports history. They're actually one of the top teams in the country today in football. I think they're number five in the whole country. So rich heritage of sports, you know, from that high school. And then I thought my career was over, Jamie, but at the last minute, I got a full scholarship offer to go to Howard University at the very, very end from Steve Wilson, who actually played his pro ball for the Broncos and uh, under Dan Reeves and for the Cowboys under Tom Landry. And I was able to get that scholarship, Jamie, off to, I went to college and I ended up majoring in business finance. I got my degree and I was going to go work on Wall Street as an investment banker, but the NFL had different plans and I was actually the first and still to this day, Jamie, the only offensive lineman ever drafted from Howard University mm -hmm. to the National Football League. Yeah, that that's a yeah, that surprises me a little bit. I assume you would have had, you know, because Howard's had some decent players, right, and uh, in the NFL, but just, so yeah, uh, only linemen. And uh, were you that big in high school too, or did you bulk up a lot in college? I grew, so I was six three when I left high school, and I got to almost six six before my uh, before my freshman year at Howard. So I grew a lot in that because I was seventeen when I graduated. So mm. I had a lot of opportunity to grow get bigger. And then I redshirted my first year at Howard. Then I became a four-year star. I was a redshirt freshman starting tackle. So I was a tackle my entire career at Howard, except for the last six games of my senior year, where I got put to center because our starting center blew out his knee and nobody could snap the ball but me. And I had to go into center and play the last six games of my senior year at center that I had never played in my life ever. <laughs> were you did you have to call line adjustments then too yep sure did <laughs> I find the mic linebacker make adjustments and that's really talking about life because in life Jamie you're gonna get things thrown at you that aren't expected you're gonna have to pivot you're gonna have to make adjustments and I've pivoted and gone through a lot of ups and downs and all arounds in my career both in uh, the NFL and in life after so I'm very much cognizant and aware of how hard it is for you people to understand that in life you have to be prepared because anything can come your way. Yeah, I I think it's really interesting too, like how sports, you know, the, teach us so many life lessons, right? It, it's very easy to draw out of them. And, you know, being able to pivot to, you know, yours actually at like one of the highest levels, right? Of going from, you know, a starting, you know, uh, you know, player and shifting all the way over to center, very different, right. Responsibilities play in and play out, um, you know, and then how that's going to move throughout your life. And I, I went to Davidson. So for college and, and Curry went there and, um, you know, I'm a couple of years older than him, but, you know, the interesting thing him too, and he's talked about it a lot is shifting from right. Being that pure shooting guard where he just came off screens all the time, to playing point guard and how impactful that probably was for his career. And, you know, Bob McKillop helping and coaching along with that. And, uh, you know, I think about those things, right? Like how fantastic he is and probably for you too, like did that switch help you at all? Like when you went to the next level in the NFL, was that, was that beneficial? Did you understand the game a little bit better after shifting to center? Yeah, it helped me. You know what it did, Jamie, to be real honest with you, it helped me get tougher. Because at tackle, I didn't have to really get super physical. I mean, I did, but a lot of times it was the rush ends, the pretty guys that wanted to do spin moves and wanted to do all the up and downs, which is great. Yeah. 
guys are heavier. There's less space. I mean, like the point of impact is more power. Like we don't have any of that stuff going on. Like the the guys aren't like getting a two or three yard head started coming and bowling into you like a DN, which is still very hard. But at, you know, at, at guard or center, man, like they're right on top of you. And if you make one wrong move or get off balance, man, it's over. And if you get beat at tack, you can maybe run around the quarterback. You get beat at guard or center, it's really hard for the guy to miss the quarterback unless he's just a shifty quarterback like a Justin Fields or a Kyler Murray, then it's different. But again, I tell you what, man, it's just a lot because people don't understand it's just a whole different breed on that interior. And, and so what was uh, – you, you said you were thinking about going to Wall Street. NFL has different plans. What was draft like – the whole draft process like? So I mean – yeah. No, for me, the draft process to me was, a, was interesting because I didn't think I was going to get drafted. I, I, I thought my career was going to be over after Howard. I'm, like, I'm done playing football. It was great. I was a four year starter at a major college, had fun. Yes. Right before my last year, right before my, my fifth year, I had, you know, I saw my name in a draft book. I was like, Marcus Ogden, 6'6, 325, off the tackle. Younger brother, Jonathan Ogden, great speed, great hand movements, needs to get stronger, needs to get better at the point of attack, needs to work on his knee bend, but has potential to be a draft pick. I was like, who? Wait, wait, wait. Marcus Ogden? Howard? That's me. So I remember (laughs) calling my brother saying, like, Jonathan, what do you think about this? Marcus, look, you know, if people are seeing you in the draft books and and they're seeing what you're doing, that means that you have a chance. What you do with that chance is up to you. So I ended up that last year working my tail off, getting with my strength coach. And it was so lucky, Jamie. We actually got a strength coach right before my last year. And we're still friends to this day because he helped me with workouts and strength and and preparation, getting my 40 down and all these things. And between that, I went to uh, uh, an all-star game, went to the Hula Bowl and played against guys from... Florida State, Miami, Rice, Texas. So my head coach in that game was Mac Brown, who's now back at Chapel Hill. My O-line coach, believe it or not, Jamie, was Jack Harbaugh, Jim and John's father. And on the other side coaching was Larry Coker from Miami at the time. So it was amazing. I had a great game, great week of practice. And I had a great workout at Howard. I went to have some great private workouts. I went to visit some teams, uh, general managers, head coaches, O-line coaches. And, you know, it worked out. And it was amazing. And like I tell everybody, just like you do in life and business, you get an opportunity, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to make the most of it and give it your all? Or are you going to say, hmm, I'm going to just put one toe and see what happens. If I took that approach, Jamie, I would have never made the, I would have never made the national football league, not a chance in the world. So, you know, stepping in after the draft, what, what was the biggest adjustment day one? Like when you walked in there, was it playbook? Was it the skill and size of everyone? Was it just not knowing where, where you are? I mean, but you had your brother. You probably could call him if you got <laughs> too worried. But Well, it, no, honestly, Jamie, it was the speed of the game. It was the speed of the game, the players, the size differential, and the strength was absolutely just enormous. And I had never seen strength and size like that on people that I played against. I did see it somewhat in the All-Star game. So I did have some good inclination from that perspective. But let me tell you, my friend, when you get in there and you start seeing guys like John Henson was 6'7", 340, Marcus Stroud, 6'6", 320. You start seeing guys like Hugh Douglas was like 6'3", 265. Even when he was like there at Jacksonville, past his prime, still phenomenal football player, you know, playing against guys like Jason Taylor, you know, playing against guys like Kevin Williams. I mean, it just – it was just a never-ending – saga of phenomenal athletes at the highest level possible. This never ended. <laughs> who was who it? Do you have somebody that stuck out in your mind that either was the toughest that you kind of went up against uh, or you just didn't have a good day against them? 
<laughs> oh yeah. Oh, absolutely, man. I remember, man. You know, uh, Jason Taylor, like yeah. amazing football player, great speed, great leverage, long arms. Like he would long arm with that inside stab. And if you tried to come over too quickly and chop off your inside hand, he would grab your inside shoulder and come on and come underneath because he had such long arms. If you tried to go out, if you tried to chop it off you from the outside, if you missed, he would pin your outside elbow and turn the corner. So you had to time it right. You had to really sit down as bull, but not give him too much space where he would just get a lot of force and momentum and drive you back to the quarterback. And that's why he was so good because he was just so tall, lean, and great leverage. He could get under you. If he got under you at that point, it was like just hope to hang on for dear life and not get run over because he just had that much great leverage. Yeah, I, I always, I mean, it, it's it's cool hearing you say that because I just always thought, right, like he had that different physique with that length in general than anyone else. And I, I remember kind of when he got traded to D.C. too, which, you know, he wasn't there for too long, maybe two years or something like that. But uh, yeah, just the incredible length. I mean, one of the best DNs ever to play, really. Oh, ever play, ever play, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. So uh, what was the toughest part for you? Like NFL, right? Everyone talks, you know, or, or at least fans love it. What was the toughest part about being in the NFL? I mean, you were on a handful of teams, so obviously you probably went through cut days that weren't fun, sure. relocating. Like what was, you know, when you look back, what, I mean, what could you, what would you change? Maybe that's a better question. If you were in charge of the NFL today, <laughs> you know, what would you change? I mean, you, I don't know if I would change anything. I think I would have made myself realize that it's a business and I was very much on like the game side of it. Like, and then it's, you know, you got cut, go to a new team and have to relocate I didn't understand what well, I understood, but I wasn't as really sound and really clear focused on how much of a business it was. And it still is. And that's what people don't understand. That it's a game which you watch on TV, but practice, the, the way in which you prepare, the way in which you have to organize yourself and look at things and watch film and eat and live and all, and then you're, meetings and all the things you got to do it's such a business and if you don't understand that and come into that with that perspective you are not going to make it long because the game will chop you up spit you out and move on to the next one because it is a great game but it's a game that is first and foremost a true business yeah, it's uh, you know, it it's tough to think about that, right? That like people's livelihoods and lives are at stake too, and right, but it's a business, right? And they're gonna make cost cutting measures, right? Because it's a business. They're running again a PNL. Um, it's you know, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, when you uh, I guess a, another question. I don't know if you feel like answering it, which we can always just skip it too. <laughs> Uh, I was like, so uh, what do you, when you think about college, now you weren't at a college uh, that's probably in line with this as much, but when you look at college student athletes today and you know, that that's a big thing out there, right? Should they be paid? What should we stipend them? Um, where, do you have any thoughts on that today um, on kind of where colleges go? And if we don't want to cover this one, but I, I, I think I actually wrote, I've written a couple of articles on this one. So I always like to hear people's thoughts on it. I think you should get, I think you should get paid. I think that they have a right to get paid so that they don't have to go to family or ask other people for financial assistance. Like these, the schools are making millions. Yes, you're getting a free education. I understand that, but gas and food and expenses and the cell phone and all that. You can't say, well, I play for Georgia. I play for Alabama. I don't have to pay you like what? Like, no, like, you know, I got to make our money. So pay them so they can make money and they don't have to worry about trying to get a job or what they're going to do to survive and all this other stuff. You'll cut down on a lot less unnecessary stuff. I yeah. feel if you're paying these players to help them take care of expenses that they have to incur. Yeah. Well, th thanks for sharing that. I know that 
you know, I, it's not my soapbox. I, I, I have a lot of trouble understanding how schools control people ability to earn for things like likeness and things like that too. Like, cause I always think back and it's like, well, if I was like a famous guitar player and I went to school on a full scholarship and I felt like selling my music, I absolutely could. Right. <laughs> like, so, well, you know, it, it always bothered me um, that like that was limited for people. It still does bother. I shouldn't say, it, I guess I said always did, but uh, yeah. So I appreciate that. Well, so when you were going through the NFL, how did you get your mindset ready to leave? And, you know, when did you start realizing that you, you might not be in there forever? Right. Cause you, you did play a while, but it, probably at some point, three, four years in, you're all in, you're mentally there you're locked in, but you, when did you start thinking about life after the NFL? When I realized that my brother was letting me know about the stress he was under from his body, like his hamstring, his big toe, what he would go through, like taking cortisone shots in his toe, in his leg to keep going. And the amount of just physical turmoil it does to your body and what it does to just you know, it just breaks your body down to the highest level, to the to the highest degree of just stress and, and adversity and pushing. And the body's not designed to go through that much stress. I don't care how much you work out, how much you train, how much you lift, how much you run, how much you eat well. Your body is not designed for that. And when I saw my brother, who was one of the best, if not the best left tackle to ever put pads on, start to see his game decline from injury and from just things, no fault of his own. I'm like, yep, if it had to happen to my brother, it could happen to me or anybody else. So that was kind of my wake up call because my brother, I, I left the league in 07, 08. My brother's last year was 08, 09. So I left the game and in the year after that, my brother officially retired. And what, what was the, I guess at that point, like, what was the plan when you were, you know, were you thinking about a business plan right after? Were you thinking about, you know, it, obviously, as I said, you went into a lot of things, coaching and, and mentorship and, uh, but what was kind of the plan to start? There was no plan. I mean, really there wasn't because even though I knew it was coming, I wasn't ready for it. So the only plan I really had was I was like, okay, what can I do after I stop feeling sorry for myself, Jamie, with the alcohol, the excessive drinking and nightlife and gambling? Then I said, okay, I remember I went to a course, uh, you know, during my NFL about construction development. So I said, let's go ahead and start a construction company. Let's just start small, let's just piddle around, let's have fun. And, you know, that's what I did. And then I met a business partner. And then I went to an event at Morgan State University, you know, in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Her congressman, Elijah Cummings, talk about the next person in this room will become the next major contractor and developer and will just absolutely dominate the market and sit at the table and create their own table in the process. And I said, well, hey, that sounds like that could be me. Why not? So what did I do? I followed it. I went after it. But what happened? Built this massive company. And then around the third, almost four year mark, I got real arrogant. I got real self-centered. I got real just egomaniac. And I ended up one of my best employees tried to tell me about where we were struggling, what we were doing, we weren't taking care of certain job sites, we weren't watching our money, our, our looking at our, from a financial perspective, we had a lot more expenses going out than coming in. And he was right, because I ended up spending about two and a half to $3 million of my money, Jamie, in less than 90 days. And he said, Mark, if we keep this up, we're not going to be able to last. Oh, we got a line of credit cards. This is, a, this is a change order work. Don't worry about it. We're going to get paid and we're going to get our money back plus 15% for our time and for our profit. You'll see. So go home. He left the company that following Monday. Let me go back. That following Monday, he puts in his two-week resignation. Six months later, like he predicted, we went bankrupt. So he came into the office that Monday put his two-week resignation papers in, uh, Jamie, was gone two weeks later. And like he predicted, six months later, Jamie, we're bankrupt, I'm broke, home foreclosed on, both cars repossessed in the same day when I moved to Raleigh, 
nothing in the bank, 400 bucks. That's all I had. I was a multimillionaire, April 2012. I had $400 to my name, April 2013. So you, you brought up a couple of things and thanks for sharing there, first of all. And uh, I know you, you share this and help raise others up now, but what, you know, how, how did you let ego, I guess, kind of get in front of you? Like, did you, have you, did you stop and think back after then, right? Do that reflection and say, you know, what happened? Where did I, cause you know, obviously you did figure out some of the business aspects for a while, but you kind of almost said it to some degree, it was personal, right? It was ego and spending and things like that. They got out of line. So what happened is Jamie, is that looking back when I had, so I came to Raleigh, I was working for Merrill Lynch. I got fired after two months, all my fault. The next day I got a job to a construction company, fired five days later. So I was fired two times in the same week from Merrill Lynch and a construction company. Ended up coaching football to the youth as a private trainer, opened a business, going well for a while. But then my kids started to go into football season. The training got less and less. I was running out of money. We were getting ready to hit really bad times. We were already in hard times. It was about to get a lot worse. So I took a job, Jamie, as a custodian, making $8.25 an hour, working from 10 p.m. till 5 a.m. in downtown Raleigh as a custodian. And when I had my pivotal moment where somebody's trash and rotten meat and banana peels and horrible protruding nasty garbage, my spoiled milk moment happened to me, right, Jamie? That was my rock bottom moment. That woke me up. And I said, wow, if I don't make a change today, I will be right here for the rest of my life. And to answer your question, looking at it in 2013, September, after that moment, I realized that I broke the cardinal rule of business. I don't care if you're in financial planning. I don't care if you're in law. I don't care if you're in technology. I don't give a damn what you do. Broke the cardinal rule of business. I started treating people as commodities, not people as human beings and as valued assets that run the business. Zig Ziglar has a great quote. You don't build the business, you build people and people build the business. And I lost sight of that and it cost me, Jamie, everything. So after you hit that kind of rock bottom moment, what, what was the change that you made? What did you do next? So when I came home and I wrote down my goals, I made a vow to myself. When I was a custodian, Jamie, everybody would mock me, didn't speak to me, told me to get out of their way, clean that baseboard, splay that table, take that garbage out, don't talk to me. Like they treated me like I was less than a human. And I vowed to myself, if I ever got into a position where I can have people listen to me, or I regain my self-respect, or I get myself out of this debacle that I put myself in, I would never, ever, ever let ego get in the way ever again. And that's what happened. And I never, ever, Jamie, from this day, I have, we have a very good business. We've worked for, as a speaker, Jamie, I've worked for 20, now 20 Fortune 500 companies. Of the 20, Jamie, I would say the majority are financial planning. Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, AXA Equitable, you know, uh, all, all JP Morgan and Chase, all these phenomenal businesses. But I told myself and I vowed to myself, I would never, ever, ever get myself in a position where my ego would drive me to be somebody that people loathe, hated, and disrespected the way that people loathe me, hate me, didn't respect me with Caden when I built an eight-figure business and then became this egotistical, arrogant maniac. So you're, you're doing the speaking now. I mean, what else do you love doing today, right? Like what... Uh, yeah, I, you know, what it, What really just gets you excited? Obviously, motivating people speaking is always fun. I love doing it too. I get it. But yeah, what else do you love doing right now? I love consulting for organizations, coming in, helping them solve problems. I love helping people through my one-on-one -on -one coaching. But also, I just love to help people succeed where I failed 
plain and simple, speaking, coaching, we've written two best-selling books, we've turned our life around, we've done all these different things, right? And really and truly for me, that's the joy, helping people succeed where I have failed. That's what I'm all about. And when you kind of, actually, I, I, I forgot to ask this. I was going to the, the goal that you wrote down. What was, do you remember the goal that you wrote down after you hit your rock bottom moment? Oh yeah. I hit my three, my three biggest strengths were the following. Number one, I was great at communication. Number two, I was great at storytelling. Number three, I wanted to help NFL athletes specifically not make my mistakes. And that were, those were my three biggest strengths. And then I computed that I want to be a speaker. And my goal was to get a speaking job in the first 12 months. I didn't hit that. I went to 18 months, didn't hit that. Went to, went to 24, didn't hit that. I hit it at 30 months. Most people said, Marcus, what in the world were you thinking? You went 30 months with no paid job. I said, yeah, I did. And I just kept saying, if I quit today, this 12 months is going to be worth it. I quit today. This 18 months is going to be worth it. I just kept telling myself and kept telling myself that. And I got my first break, Jamie. It's actually been five years exactly this month. It was my first pay speech job, April 2016. Very nice. And how did that one come about? Great question. They found me on Speaker Match. And it was an old platform. And they reached out to me. We had some discussions. They went to a board process and then they hired me and it absolutely was just amazing because I spoke at their 100th, at their 100th commencement graduation speech in Wilmington, North Carolina for about a thousand people. Nobody had any idea that was my first paid job. Nobody. So they thought, oh, you did great. And looking back on it, Jamie, I was absolutely horrible. <laughs> I was, I sucked. But I brought energy, I brought passion, but I brought no action steps, no real thought process. I was sweating, I was stammering, I was looking like, you know, I was lost. But again, you know, it's, it's like the old saying, think until you make it. And so I did, and I just continued to grow and get more jobs, and some jobs that were paid, some weren't. I just kept kind of hustling and bustling, and here we are today. Yeah, I... Uh... Have you done a bunch of commencement speeches now too? Yes, I was. I did one for you know for them. I just did one, a big one for Western Governors University. Uh, for that, they're the largest online school in the country. Jamie, about one hundred twenty-five thousand students, uh, you know, enroll each year. That was awesome. Went to Salt Lake City. That got great responses from the from the. I got a ninety-six percent approval rating from the graduates, one of the highest they ever had from a commencement speech, because I always leave with my story, but then Jamie is tying in the action steps to my story to help people succeed where I have failed. Yeah, it's a, that's a great lesson for speakers. Um, and you brought it up the first time you did it, you probably didn't have action steps. Um, I, I still see a lot of speakers that don't, sometimes I don't add them in either if I'm doing less prep. <laughs> But, you know, that's such an important thing. And I was doing one for an event that I went through an interview process similar to probably you've done a bunch of times. And they closed with like, well, I need three. That's all. If you don't have three, we're not doing it. And he came back with that. And I ended up writing three. And then to me, that's always important to close with like true action steps when you leave any type of, you know, probably not just speaking, but probably any type of engagement or meeting. I try to get better at that now. Like I'm always asking like, what's the purpose of this meeting? Like, what are we trying to get out of it? Cause a lot of people, it's gotten very easy to put zooms on calendars, right? And you just fill up your day with meetings and I don't even know why I'm in there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I'll tell you, James, is that, you have to figure out, like the financial planning, a lot of things I talk to people about are sales enhancement techniques, how to market themselves, how to market themselves in the new world, how to pivot to get in front of your audience, how to you know, help you if you're a minimal manager, how can you help become a better servant leader to the other financial plans that might be struggling or, or new and don't know how to do things. And there's three things I tell people all the time, Jamie. There's three ways to market your business. One is social positioning, i.e. social media, networking calls, referral calls. 
We all want to do referral calls all day. They're the easiest. I call them the hot leads. The problem is, as you keep talking to people, Jamie, your circle gets it shrinks. Shrinks, 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 shrinks. When you do the referral calls. Networking calls are good. People that are in your network you might not have work for them. They know of you. But again, you keep calling people, it's going to start to shrink, 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 shrink. Social positioning, i.e. social media posting, as you talk to people, it expands because you're meeting somebody new, you're talking to them, like, oh, by the way, I know this property too. Literally, Jamie, I have this podcast. The company Equus out of California, that's how we met. I met her on LinkedIn. We had a call. Marcus, you'd be a phenomenal speaker for our Las Vegas chapter. Oh, by the way, on the next call we have, I'm going to bring my head of Las Vegas onto the call to help you meet him. So as we do work for us, he can get you some from our, some of our sponsors to help you expand your network. So I, when I do big speeches, I, I talk about that because that's going to be a major part. And people are scared to death of social media, Jamie. But I'm like, look, don't go out there trying to just talk about your business all the time. Don't go out there just trying to promote yourself all the time. I have worked on a, a action step, kind of like a, a good mixture of types of content you put out, how often, and it's really helped us, Jamie, these last 12 months, especially through COVID, grow when a lot of people have been, unfortunately, declining. Yeah, we might even call it a framework for that. <laughs> hey, how about that? A framework for the podcast. I like that. That's what it is. So the framework is one in which you get people's attention, but you don't bore them or you don't come across as like this, oh, another person posts about their business. Oh, like you have to come across as authentic. You have to connect with them on a deep level, there's three ways to connect with people through trying to sell to them. And I'll just say one of the three is bring emotion, bring your authenticity, bring your realness, bring out who you are to connect with that person or those people. And that will give you a real good fighting chance to get on their calendar, to at least have a conversation to maybe hopefully do what, Jamie? Turn into business. Well, uh, I've probably got two or three more questions just looking at the time. And that's my only job here is to ask questions and watch the time. <laughs> uh, so uh, the uh, another one would be if you wanted to kind of describe, let's say somebody looks back at your life, you know, in a long time from now, but it, it says, you know, here's what Marcus stood for. What would you like that to be? Like if somebody looked back and described your legacy, what are you hoping that is? I hope people say that Marcus was a person of perseverance, grit, and determination that fought through a lot of adversity to get where he wanted to go in life and help others to get where they want to go in life as well. So I, I love grit and determination. Um, if uh, This is a fun exercise too. We don't have to do the whole thing here today. But if you were going to say, I want to pass on two or three qualities to my kids, um, would you try to pass those on too? Like, is that what you would try or would Absolutely. you pick different ways? Yeah. I have two daughters. And I want them to understand they can be strong, persevering, grit driven women. They don't have to rely on a man. They can rely on themselves and they want to just be the shining example for their kids and their community and that what they're going to do in their life. That's awesome. Yeah, I've got I've got one daughter and I think about that all the time. Just how do I how do I, you know, when whenever my son or somebody says, oh, that's for boys or something, I'm like, now nah, you can do it, too. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, it's, yeah, it's, of course. I mean, I, there's no there's nothing that can't get done. As long as they believe in themselves, they can do anything. Yeah. Well, I, I'd love to ask one more question that was back a little bit, and then we'll close out here in the next couple of minutes. Um, you brought up after you left kind of the, the NFL, you ran into, um, you know, like you were drinking and, and partying and going out and all of that. I mean, obviously, you know, drinking has a huge impact on people's mental state when you get too far into that. I mean, did you hit a point there where you like, what was uh, And I know you talked about the story with uh, Elijah Cummings too, who passed away, sadly, um, you know, was a great leader uh, in Maryland and for the country. But um, did you hit a point with the drinking where you realized it was like a problem for you? 
or, you know, and how did you kind of overcome that? Cause that's, you know, a lot of people I think are probably suffering with that this last year without as many outlets, you know, a lot of the AA meetings went virtual, but it's not quite the same community that people are seeing. So I know that mental health aspects really big. Yeah. So I realized I had a problem when I woke up one morning, not knowing where I was and I said, yep, I got to get this fixed. And so I ended up getting some therapy, getting some help. And that was the best thing I ever did because it helped me realize I had a problem. And if I was going to get myself better, I had to fix it right away. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Um, it, you know, so last two questions here um, it really is uh, what's the best way for people to follow you, interact with you? So all that, you know, website, social media, all the stuff we talked about. <laughs> People can find me on my, our website, www.marcus, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S, Ogden, O-G-D-E-N.com. We're on LinkedIn, Marcus Ogden, Instagram at Marcus Ogden, Twitter at Marcus underscore Ogden. Connect with us and we'll be good to go. So reach out to us. All right. Well, I'm going to throw you uh, one more final curveball one, which hopefully is fun, right? Uh, if you could uh, have played any other sport besides football, what Basketball. would you have picked? Basketball. That was, that <laughs> you was, that was you only good? <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm actually really good. I am. I'm getting older, but I got bad knees, but I love basketball, man. Absolutely. Yeah, what, what position would you have played? My height, probably a small forward, shooting guard, small forward. All right. Very good. Well, uh, yeah, I, I love that. Uh, basketball's fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's easy question for you then. So uh, favorite team? Are you a basketball fan? Oh, yeah. I'm a Lakers fan. I'm a LeBron fan. Yeah, me too. I love LeBron. So he's uh, all the way around big LeBron fan. So I, I'm hoping they they can pull off another, uh, you know, repeat this year. That's what I'm pulling for. So, well, hey. Marcus, uh, I love this. I love your story. I love the impact you're having. And, you know, I, you know, I also really appreciate it when people are willing to share because, you know, we get a lot of guests that, you know, struggle sharing their personal and you didn't struggle at all with that. So thank you. And I know you go out and do that and teach people this. So it's been uh, fantastic having you on the show here today. Thank you very much for having me, Jim. I really appreciate it. And for uh, everyone else that's listening, thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast.